many of you, um, let's do this. We have some time. I'm going to cut out some of my sermons so we get out of here on time. Um, how many of you, let, let's see how you do this. Uh, introduce yourself quickly to one person you don't know. And that, that'll actually lead us into the, the sermon today. So stand up, get a little, okay, someone you don't know, okay. Hi, Mindy. Okay, are you doing good? The, um, there's hugs too, interesting. Mindy, you watching this? You're not watching it, look. <laughs> okay, did you meet somebody? Okay, all right, enough. Okay, thank you. <laughs> They're out of control. The, um, apparently that's working. Okay, here's why we did that. <clears throat> uh, today, t today in the passage, um, okay. T today, um, Dave, are we ready? We're ready. Thank you. Okay. Dave's seated. We can go. I was just stalling to get Dave back to his seat. The, um, uh, th just to prove it, because that took some time, I'm going to take uh, part of my sermon away, okay? No, just... <laughs> yeah, uh, that was your music, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. I owe you. Um, okay. Um, today, it, you'll notice the passage. God and Moses are kind of meeting for the first time. Uh, now, did, did you go up to anybody, introduce yourself, but they already knew your name? Did that happen? Okay, do you notice that with God and Moses, God already knew Moses' name. Like there's a burning bush, Moses goes up to it. Hi, I'm Moses. Not, no need for that. Hi, I'm God, which God does do, and he says it already. You know what he is. So how many of you have done that before? You know someone's name before you even meet them, before you know anything about them? You know that that's what God does to Moses today. So that's called stalling for time. I mean, that's called an illustration to show you um, what's going to happen today. Uh, one of the most important passages, I think, where God... His self-disclosure, his revelation on who he is, and that's what we get. I am. Um, John and Mary Barnett, are they here? Talk about introduction. Where are they? Okay. Come see me afterwards. There you are. Um, here's what they're... Uh, you're in trouble. The, um, no. Uh, the, we're, we're doing membership different now in that you watch a YouTube instead of going to a class or something because we're all busy and stuff. And um, So you watch a YouTube video on what our church is all about, which is basically just making disciples. That's all we want to do. We're not out to make a name for ourselves or get a building. If the Lord provides us with those things on the way, that's fine. But our job is to make disciples. What does that mean? Well, you watch the video, then you go in back and you get an application. Um, and then that starts the application process for membership. It's real quick and easy as long as you uh, say you watch the video. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Watch it. So it's only um, three hours of your time. No, it's like a half hour. So uh, uh, that's it. That's the process. And uh, as you put on your Connect card, we'll explain it to you in person. So uh, there you have it. Um, so uh, God says to Moses, tell me a little about it. Moses says to God, tell me a little bit about yourself. Do you ever, do you ever say that to anybody? Job interview right? Here's a job interview with Moses and God. It's just wonderful. Uh, Moses is languishing, wandering around the wilderness for 40 years, just shepherding. His whole life from 40 years old to 80 years old is just watching his father-in-law's sheep. That is it. Um, I think he learned one thing, slow down, relax. Uh, you think about this burning bush. Was Moses the only one who slowed down long enough to see the bush burning? I mean, how many other people zoom by that area with this burning bush thing? I, I don't know. But the, the point is that we talked about last week, there are bushes all around us. Moses saw this one, and it was all about the glory of God. We are all just, uh, as we come together as churches, we're not great, we're not awesome. We come to help make this place strange, right? Amen? You weirdos, amen? Okay, all right. Uh, listen to last week's sermon if you don't know what I'm talking about. If you're offended, that's okay, I forgive you. Okay. <laughs> All right, so Moses saw this one. The whole thing that made this bush different from all the other bushes out there was God's glory. So here's what God, it's again, part two on this burning bush. What kind of God is God? 
Well, you can, you can go to a church, you can go to a book, you can do all these things to try and figure that out, but God is going to help us to show us what kind of God is God. What does he want us to know about himself? That's the whole point of this burning bush episode. And basically, it's number one. Here's what I want you to know, Moses. I am the God with a past. I am the God with a people. I am the God that has a record. Look at this, verse 6 again. He said, I am the God of your father. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. That's the first thing out of God's lips to tell Moses what kind of God he is. Think about that. I am the God of your father, Moses. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. What does God want Moses to know about himself? What does God want us to know about God? I am the God with a people. Uh, I am the God with a past. I'm the God with a record. Think about it. I am the God with a reputation. Whew. Check out my resume, Moses. Right? Uh, there's a, a commercial on the radio where the, the guy says, I'm not trying to do something. It's a realtor. He says, uh, I'm out to get a job. He's trying to earn a job with them. This is what God is doing. Moses, I know these people from your past, and I am their God. That's what God's telling him. That's the first thing that he's going to tell Moses. Uh, people from the past, people from your past, Moses, these people who believed in me, these people who had faith in me, these people who literally stood on solid ground with their trust in me, that's who I am. I mean, what Moses is hearing, funnel it through, is it's, I am the covenant God. That's who I'm meeting right now, this covenant God, this God who makes promises and keeps promises. That's who he is. I have a history with these people, Moses. My people are, are your people. And I keep promises and I have been faithful. It, it, think about it. If Israelites are spending hundreds of years in captivity, hundreds of years being oppressed. If they need anything right now, it's this. Hope. And Moses, languishing for 40 years as a shepherd, he, he, the biggest excitement in his life is if a bear tries to come and eats his sheep, right? Is that the most exciting thing? Or avoiding sheep piles? If, if Moses needs anything right now, it's hope. So how does this quote from God, I am the God of these people, I am the God with a past, how does this self-explanation from God give hope? So let's unpack that first. Um, I am the God of your father, I'm the God of Abraham, I'm the God of Isaac, I'm the God of Jacob. How does this bring hope? Well, here's what's going to help us. is uh, Jesus is going to use this very verse, Exodus 3.6. Way back uh, later in his earthly ministry, you remember that in Matthew 22, the Sadducees are going to try and trap Jesus. Do you remember this story? Sadducees were a bunch of uh, goofy religious people. They were uh, pro-Rome. Pharisees were anti-Rome. Sadducees were pro-Rome. Sadducees basically only believed in the first five books of the Bible. So Jesus is going to quote this verse in part of the Bible that the Sadducees really like. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Okay, uh, Sadducees are self-sufficient. They really, they deny that God is actually involved in our everyday life. So that's what makes them self-sufficient. We don't need God. We can do this. We have certain knowledge. You know, we could pick ourselves up. Uh, we don't need God because God doesn't really do that anyway. So they're self-sufficient. They also don't believe in a resurrection. They do not believe in an afterlife. They do not believe in a spirit realm, angels and demons. So these Sadducees are going to come to Jesus and they're going to say, Gee, let, let's trap them. We're going to trick Jesus because we're so smart. We're smarter than Jesus. Remember they tell Jesus this uh, little story about Moses commanded us, if a brother dies, his, his, if a guy dies, his brother's got to marry his wife. You remember that? And then they go on this, this ridiculous story is seven times it's going to happen. One brother, no children. Second brother dies, no children. Third brother marries this woman. Seven times that happens, right? You remember that? Matthew 22. Okay, so Jesus, in trying to answer this trap, like, oh, no, they're trapping me now with this wonderful story, this ridiculous story. Uh, seven guys married to one woman, and then they ask, oh, who is she married to in the afterlife? In the afterlife, they don't believe, by the way, right? Okay, all right. So Jesus quotes this verse while they're trying to trap him. Why? How? What does that mean? Here's what the Sadducees' problem is. Now, if Jesus had a commentary in his library, he would take out the commentary and look what the Sadducees believe and don't believe, Right? But Jesus didn't do that. He didn't say, Sadducees, you're self-sufficient. You don't believe in the afterlife. You don't believe in angels. You don't believe in the spirit world. He didn't say that. He said, you guys have two problems. Do you remember what he said their two problems were? He said this, you don't know the Bible 
and you don't know the power of God. That's their biggest problem. You don't know the Bible, and you don't know the power of God. In coming to him with a trap, who marries you? This guy marries her, and then this guy dies, and this guy marries her. Seven times that happened. Jesus says, hmm, okay, uh, your problem is you don't know your Bible, and you don't know the power of God. <sighs> so Jesus answers him with a straight, and I love this. God raises the dead. It's basically Jesus' point. God raised himself from the dead. So that's power. So you want to know the power of God, know it this way. God can take dead people and make them alive again. You don't believe that, but I'm telling you it's because you don't know the power of God. When something's as dead as a doornail, God can take that dead as a doornail person and make them alive again. That is the power of God. Powerful so much so that when Jesus dies, no one takes his life. I know the Jews get blamed, the Romans get blamed. Jesus took his own life and then he gave it back again, John 10. That's power, folks. Sadducees didn't understand that power. But then he also says this, you don't know your Bible. And to, to hammer home the point that you don't know your Bible, Jesus quotes Exodus 3.6. Uh, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So how does that bring hope? Think about it. <sighs> hope. For Jesus' argument to make sense, the God of the universe has to be the God in whom Abraham belongs. Now, if, if you're hurting, if you're struggling, if you need comfort, if you need deliverance, if you need salvation, if you need healing, this verse is going to start you on the road to hope. This God who can help me now is the God who's helped Abraham. And Abraham is not extinct. He's still alive. And he's mine and I'm his. I am the God of Abraham. If you need hope, here's your hope in the God who raises the dead. I mean, death is no problem for this God. If you need hope, here's a God with a people. The God of the past is very much in your present. This God in your present problem, you need hope? God. Your present predicament? God. Uh, there is hope. There is help. And who, who, who is that hope and help from? We talked about it last week. It's this God who kind of takes dead people and makes them alive again forever and ever and ever. Moses, you want to know who I am? I'm the God with a past. Your past. I have a record. I have a, re a reputation. I have a, re a relationship with people. Uh, in fact, people you know, people you adore, people you respect, I'm their God. They're my people. Uh, I have a resume, Moses, and he gives them his resume. Uh, Abraham is not extinct. I belong to him. He belongs to me. I haven't lost him. Even through death, Moses, I haven't lost Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They're still mine. Uh, I am the God of your past. I am the God who has a history with your people. Uh, and you know what? I kind of always come through. I have never failed them. I am always faithful all the time. So understand these loaded self-disclosures, this revelation of God to Moses. Uh, it's loaded. I mean, look at this self-disclosure of God playing out to Moses. This is our introductory meeting. Moses, I am the God of your past. But don't stop there. Verse 7 uh, the, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I'm concerned about their suffering. I'm not only the God with the past, I'm also the God of your present. They're crying out right now, and I see it. They're crying out right now, and I hear it right now. Uh, you don't have to wait centuries for me to start acting. I'm the God of the past, and I'm the God of your present. Verse 8, um, what Ron read there. Um, where does eight start? So I've come down to rescue them from all those people. Okay, so uh, it's the God of your future. I'm going to come down and rescue them and give them a land. So I'm not only God of the past, I'm not only God of your present who can hear your present predicament, but I'm the God of your future, waiting to bless you into this land. That's the God I am. Think about that. It seems like a job interview. Moses, hire me. <laughs> Moses, please, I want to be your God. I'm a God with a past, a present, and a future. I can do all these things. Hire me, Moses. Oh, by the way, Moses, if you hire me, I got a job for you. Go, go rescue my people. We'll get into that next week, verse 10. Uh, he is the God with a past record. He's a God with a resume. He's a God with a people. Uh, understand that. That's what that verse loaded. That Jesus takes that verse and uses it to the Sadducees. It's wonderful. So, okay, you got that? Who is God? God is the God with a people. He's the God of the past, okay? You got that? Okay, let's move on then. Uh, he's also the God with... A heart. Verse 7, I just read that. I have seen the misery. I've heard them crying. I'm concerned about their suffering. Here's the kind of God he is. 
He's the kind of God that sees misery and hears cries and is concerned about suffering. Literally, he is the God who feels. And make it personal, he is the God who feels your pain. We, 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 get, we have a group this size. How many came in this morning with a heart that's breaking, with physical pain, emotional pain? God feels your pain. I mean, it's one of the first things he wants you to know about himself. He's meeting Moses, and he could say, you know what? I'm the God of the wrath someday. I'm the God of revelation. I'm the God who created the universe. The thing he wants to hammer home is I'm the God who feels your pain. I'm the God who knows what you're going through. I'm the God who has a heart, who has compassion, and I hate seeing my people in pain. He hates it. I know their pain. I know their suffering. I know their heartbreak. He's not only aware, he knows about it. I mean, this Hebrew word, he knows about it. He, he feels it. He enters into it. Folks, this God wants you to know the pain you're going through. And he wants you to know this. He feels it. John is going to write letters to seven churches. We, we, have a, we know it as Revelation 2 and 3. Uh, there's this wonderful letter to one of the churches. And all, uh, the five of the churches, Jesus is going to do this. He's going to uh, give them some encouragement. Then he's going to zap them right between the eyes with things they're doing wrong. And then he's going to lift them up with that thing. I call it an encouragement sandwich, right? Here's what you're doing great. Here's how awful you are. And here's what you're doing great. It's an encouragement sandwich. But right in the middle is that zap right between the eyes. Church of Smyrna, he doesn't do that. No correction at all. It's a church that is uh, small. They're going through a horrible persecution. I think they are small. There's not many members because uh, casual followers have been weeded out. Who is going to come to church on a Sunday morning, uh, even though there's coffee and donuts? Who's going to come to that church if the government could come in and kill them or arrest them, right? You're going to get a smaller crowd if you can show up at church, and they're going to kill you or arrest you. Amen? Okay, so Smyrna is one of those churches. They believe in Jesus, and they're persecuted to the point of pain, death, arrest, but they believe so they can't recant. It's not like we could say, ah, oh, Jesus, forget it. They believe too much. They know it's tr uh, true. They know it's real. So when all of society is out to get you, when the government's going to arrest you and kill you, and these people still go to the church, not many, but they believe, and they're hurting. They're purged through persecution. And you remember what Jesus says to this hurting church? Do you remember this? Revelation 2. He says, I, I know your afflictions. It's literally, I know your pressure. I know your poverty. But think about that. What does God want us to know about himself? He created the universe. It's important. He's the God who's going to pour down wrath in Revelation time. That's important. It seems like he wants to hammer home. He knows what you're going through. He knows your pain. He knows your heartbreak. He knows your heartache. He is this God with a heart who feels pain, who knows our affliction. I mean, think about it. He, he understands what you're going through. You go through a horrible time. How many times do you say to yourself, maybe under your breath, uh, no one understands. No one understands. Folks, that could be true. No one understands except Jesus. Every single problem, every single crisis, every single pain Jesus knows it, but not just that. He feels it. So think about it. You're sitting at the doctor's office, and the doctor gave you his diagnosis, her diagnosis. It, it causes pain. You've been in pain. That's why you're there. Do you understand that Jesus not only knows what you're going through, but he feels that too? I mean, nowhere is this hammered home better than when Paul, Saul is going to be converted on the road to Damascus. You remember that in Acts chapter 9, right? You guys remember that story? We don't have to turn there then because you know it by heart. Uh, you remember there's how many times in the Bible where God says someone's name twice? Remember it's six times seven if you count Jerusalem. I've been saying that. Moses, Moses is one of them in Exodus 3. Exodus 9, he says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now think about that. Why, why do you persecute me? Saul, why are you beating me? Saul, why are you whipping me? Saul, why are you, you tearing the flesh off of my back? Saul, why are you taking my house and throwing, throwing me out of my house and confiscating my house? Saul, why are you doing that to me? What's he saying? Church, I know your pain. I know what you're going through, and I feel it myself. That's the kind of God I want you to know I am. 
Isaiah puts it this way, Surely who took up our iniquities, and don't call me Shirley. That's in the King James Version. <laughs> who said that? Sure, okay. Okay, you scare me, ex-cop. Okay, uh, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Imagine someone doing that. Now imagine it's God doing that. He takes on our infirmities, he carries our sorrow. Boy, this God has a heart. He wants you to know something about him. He knows what you're going through, and he feels it. He feels your pain, he knows what you're going through. Uh, Hebrews 4.15 puts it this way. Um, here's the kind of high priest we have. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. I mean, this is talking about when we sin. We can approach the throne of grace. From, from chapter 2, the end of chapter 2 through this chapter, he, he's kind of trying to tell us the kind of high priest we have. This kind of high priest sympathizes with us. He knows what we're going through. Even, and I love that he doesn't call it our sins. We blatantly sin. Sometimes we're deceived and we sin. He, he's not unable to sympathize with our weakness. Not our sin, but our weakness. Our weakness is the thing that causes us to sin. We're so weak and frail. But he, he can sympathize with that. That's the kind of high priest we have. We have one who is not only sympathizes, we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. That's the kind of priest we have. He knows our pain. He feels our pain. He's been tempted, same way we've been tempted, but he came victorious. We don't. Why? Because we're weak. So what should we do? Run to this high priest. Cling to this high priest. I don't know if you came with some kind of heartbreak, some kind of diagnosis, some kind of old age aches and pains. He knows. He feels it. And he wants you to know that about him. What kind of God is he? He's the God that has always come through. History past, he's always come through. He's never failed. And he's this God with a heart. And he has a heart for you. And he feels your pain. He knows what you're going through. So I think the thing to do is just take our burdens to him. Ooh, I don't know. Okay, last one. Uh, last one. He's a God with a name. I need to read this again because it's so wonderful. Uh, Moses said to God, who am I? I'm just a, a bush. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? 40 years ago, he said, I'm the guy. I'm the man. 40 years of being humbled. He says, who am I? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. Which, is, that what, is that what Popeye said? <laughs> God said it first, by the way. I am who I am. This is... This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Now, this is the most important thing in the Bible. What does God want us to know about himself? What does God want Moses to know about God? I'm the God with a past, with a record, with this resume, with this reputation. I've never failed. I'm the God with a heart. I know what you're going through, and I feel it. But I'm also a God with a name. Now, in, in this passage, we get the famous line from God, like I said in verse 14, famous. This is the verse that has expanded all the theology, especially of Judaism. Uh, Maddie, show that, um, show that one um, thing you had. Okay, look at this. In your Bibles, most Bibles, I'm going to say all, I'll go out on bread, they should say this. Uh, most of our Bibles have, in English, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, but they subscript the O-R-D. When you see that throughout your Bibles, that's going to be our word Jehovah, transliterated, Jehovah. So every time in your Bible you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, uh, that's Lord, that's, that's the word for Jehovah in the Hebrew, okay? When you see capital L, and then small case O-R-D, that's the word for basically the Hebrew, it's going to be Adonai, okay? Got that? Okay, so let's go through your Bibles right now and write Jehovah every time it says that. Go ahead. No? Am I kidding again? <laughs> okay, okay, so that's it, okay? Understand that. Yeah, most of you probably already knew that already. Um, six, oh, over, did I write it? Over 6,800 times we're going to get capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Ian, so what's happening? Okay, I'm going to point this way. I think I'm getting too big. I'm exercising too much. Is that what's causing that? Um, 
Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Jehovah. It's going to happen over 6,800 times in your Bibles. Uh, the other one, Adonai, it's going to happen, if I, if I counted right, over 300 times, okay? So this is an important one, and it's the one that we're getting from verse 14, this, this word that we're going to transliterate and, transliterate and call Jehovah. Um, so don't, don't confuse Lord, capital L-O-R-D, with Lord, capital L, small case, O-R-D. Uh, so many names for God in the Bible. I mean, these are wonderful studies if you ever listen to them or done them yourself. Elohim and El the Je Jehovah Jireh, all these wonderful names for God. But this one, it just kind of sticks out because it's the one where Moses says, what's your name? Who should I say sent me? And we get that one. Um, when, when you get Jehovah, sometimes Yahweh, sometimes just the consonants, W-H-W-Y-W-Y-W-H-W-Y-H-Z-X. Okay, what that is, when they just put the consonants, the four consonants are Y, Y-H-W-H. That's called the, what, tell them what it's called. Oh, you don't know what it's called? Okay. Oh, smarty. Okay. No, I, I looked at the Tetragrammaton. So write that down for me. Touch your So every time you see Y W H W, yeah, did I do it? No. Okay. Uh, tetragrammaton. That, that they're just replacing it. Remember, God's name was so holy. They're not going to write it all out. So we get those consonants, and it comes out in those four words, and we get Yahweh, and then we transliterate to Jehovah. So the context for God giving this wonderful, special, holy name to Moses and to the Israelites and to us is that this personal name and the meaning behind it. Now, you got to get this, because a lot of people want to know, what does this name mean? Well, it gives it to us right in the context. Um, Moses is resisting, remember, who am I? You know, I can't do this job. He's a broken man. He's a mess. He's humble. Uh, but people ignore it. In that context, look at verse 12 again. I mean, this is the key. I will be with you. I will be with you. So we got that first, and then we're going to get to the Yahweh and all that other stuff. So uh, don't ignore that point. I will be with you. I put Here's what I did in my Bible. I put a little yellow at I will be with you. At the bottom of my Bible, I will be what I will be. So that's how some translate it. And then we get that right in 14, I am. So Moses is still objecting. Who am I? I can't do this. Pharaoh's great. He wants me. My picture, remember, is still hanging in the post office. Um, so he's still objecting. So great. The only thing Moses has now is, I don't want to do this. And the only thing God's given me is, you're going to be, you're going to be with me. Great. What's your name, Moses asked. Not so much who, but what. Um, the character. Remember in Bible times, that it's the character behind the name so many times. Uh, so who, who's sending me? What is your name? What should I tell them? It's more than just Dave. Hi, I'm Dave. Bible times, the character and the nature of the person went with the names. Um, no one has ever called me Davey. Okay? Any of you get names like that? Ronnie, right? Were you Ronnie? Anybody get that? My dad is Phil. His family called him Philly. No one ever called me Davey. I made sure when I was little, my family wouldn't call me Davey. You know what I mean? Well, we're going to start now. Yeah, you're going to start now. Yeah. <laughs> and that's... Um, I'm just going to read... And, Taylor, that would be sin. I'm just reading the Bible. That'd be sin. Okay. Um, I don't, I, I'm not going to like it if you call me that. Now, I don't even like Dave anymore. I was trying to tell Jill this yesterday. I, I just don't resonate with the silent E anymore. I prefer David. Okay? David. Okay? No? Okay. Th this is Dave doing it, and I'm getting some resistance, okay? Now, imagine God doing this to Moses. What's your name? Who you say send to me? It's in that context that God is giving them this. You laugh and make fun and it's going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> God is doing this very thing with Moses. Here's the character, the nature behind this name that I'm sending you with. I mean, tie that in. So much of what God is saying about himself is packed into this, and it's not just I am, two little, three little letters in our language. He, he's, he's going to say it, he says it that first time, he's going to say three statements right in verses 14 and 15, and then he's going to condense it to this name. And it's incredible. Anybody can say, God has sent me to tell you. We went through a church split in our previous church. I think it was the church, first church that hired me for a weekly to, to, to do junior high. There was a huge split there. Um, Jill and I were, I was basically on staff. I was still working at, in Chicago at the time at that law firm. So I, I, I remember people, this huge split, and it was congregational rural church. So you had to bring your church mess into the, into the congregational meetings, right? Uh, now elder, elder rural church, elders just fight with each other. Yeah, I'm just kidding. It's a loving, uh, harmonious. Uh, but this congregational meeting, any of you ever involved in a congregational meeting where it got ugly? Good. 
don't, Laura, don't. Um, so people would stay, come to the microphone and they would all say this, opposing views, God told me last night. That's how they would start it. God told me last night that we should do this. God told me, and everybody, I'm like, wow, God's all over the place, right? We should do this, we should do that. Ugh. So Moses is saying, anybody could say, God has sent me to tell you guys something, but God, what's your name? What, what's your name? Not so much who is sending me, but what authority? Like, I could go say, yeah, God sent me to you, but how are they going to know it's true? G give me something here. And God's great response to that, God's awesome revealing reply to that is, I am what I am sent you. I, literally, at the bottom of my page, and I love that translation, I will be who I will be. If they ask me who sent me, here's what you say, Moses, I will be who I will be. I mean, literally, what the, what the Jewish mind is hearing is whatever you need, that's what I am and that's what I'll be. That's what you tell them. Uh, the, the verb that's being used there is to be. That's why verse 12 is so important. And God said, I will be. That, that will be, that to be is the verb being used there. So that's a huge help. If ever somebody asks you about verse 14 and 15, you got to bring in 12. So that's so important. So let the context help. I will be with you. Verse 12, verse 14, I will be what I will be. Same verb form. So what does God want us to know about himself? I mean, this is huge. Uh, I will be with you. I will be what I will be. Basically, my presence, Moses, is my name. Think about that. My presence is my name. I will be present is what I will be. Now, here's the issue here. God exists. Uh, you know, this, God isn't sending Moses to a bunch of uh, atheists. I think they know God exists, but, but what are they not sure of? And that's where the name is so important, and I, I think awesome, I think it's giddy. <sighs> it's not so much God's existence, but his presence. That's who, Moses, and, and his, his help, and his deliverance, and his salvation, his ability to save us and me in our pain. So who is sending me? What should I tell them? I will be present. That's who. That's who. I mean, verse 14 and 15, like I said, there's three statements there about the name. I will be present. Uh, then there's a shorter form. There's this name. They're basically, the Lord is what we get. But it's like the, this, all these statements that God is shoving at Moses. This is my name. And he gives all these statements. And if you, if you can summarize all those statements that God says in verse 14 and 15, if you can summarize them and condense them and comprehend them, everything in the larger statements, here's what we get. Jehovah. Yahweh. I am. That's all it is condensed in the bigger statements that God says. Ugh. So how can you say, I, I am the God you need me to be in whatever situation you find yourself in? How can you say that? Uh, can you say it in one word? Yes. Yahweh. I am, the God you need, I am the God you need me to be in whatever situation you find yourself in. Kind of a long name. It's kind of like David John of Atacola. We don't like it. Way too long. So can you condense that? Yeah. Let's condense it this way. Maybe. Yahweh. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, you shouldn't make jokes during church. Right? There's no place for it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So here's what Moses gets. Ready? Yahweh. I mean, that's all we get. We get the consonants. We try to put some other um, the, uh, opposite of consonants, vowels. We try to put them in there and then come up with Jehovah. In, in Moses' day, this Yahweh is like unpronounceable. Remember, they're not even going to write it down. That's how sacred this name is. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, right? So at the time of Moses, refuse to even write it. It's almost unpronounceable. Um, it's that holy. In fact, the closest thing you can get to this actual name that we so flippantly say Jehovah or Yahweh or whatever, it's, it's, it's kind of closer to breathing than an actual name. I mean, think about doing Yahweh like that. I mean, that, Yahweh, in and out. Think about that. I mean, is that breathing? Is that what God is trying to hammer home? What's the first thing you do as a baby? You breathe. First thing you do, or you die, is, is breathe. Um, last thing you do on your deathbed. Breathe. I mean, is that who's sending you, Moses? That, 
that this who this this is who will be with you. This is um, who is going to go with you, no matter what your circumstance. Yahweh, basically. Every breath reminding you of Yahweh. I'm 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 I'm, I'm this close, Moses. I'm that close. Dave, don't say anything. How close? That's that's how close. I mean, camp out in this revelation, camp out in this self-disclosure, because you're all going through something, and you need something that only God can give you. And this is what God wants you to know about himself. It's an intimate look. It's, it's a personal explanation, uh, not just about a name. I am always with you. I am everything you will ever need in the moment is with you. God, God is bigger than the universe he created, and he wants to be known he wants this to be known about himself. Yahweh, this breath, Jehovah, Lord. I will be with you even to the end of the age. Remember who said that? God the Son as he was going to, going to ascend into the heavenlies. I want you to know something. Yahweh, this God wants us to know, wants us to remember, wants us to live in the context of, I am with you. I mean, we, we don't get it in our English. Emmanuel. Remember what Emmanuel means at Christmas time. God is with you. I mean, what's in a name? How will Exodus unfold this book? Do you remember we said at the beginning of the book, um, basically break down Exodus this way. Uh, first 18 chapters, God's power. He delivers them. Then from verse, chapters 19 to chapters 24, not only he delivers, but he demands certain things. And we have this covenant that he goes into with the, at Mount Sinai. So it's God's power, that it's his will. He demands certain things. But then it, the chapters where I start to fold off a bit. If you ever read the Bible through in a year, um, I start to really get trouble in uh, Exodus 25 because the tabernacle is this, and it's this measurement, and it's this long, and the purple curtains, and bleh. It's God's presence, though. And started to be convicted this week that he, he does so much of the book leading up to the tabernacle. I like the early chapters, and I really struggle with the later ones, but you notice the key to the later chapters is this. Listen to this key verse I found. Okay. Chapter 25, this is that second, the third section where God's just going to work on the tabernacle. What is he trying to hammer home in this whole tent? Make a tent, Moses. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. That's the key to the tabernacle. He's getting so descriptive, so detailed on what this tent should look like. And he says, here's the whole point of it. I want to live among these people. The end of chapter 29, verses 46 and 47, he says this. Uh, uh, verse 45 and 46, then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. I mean, it's like he's shooting for this. This is the whole thing he wants them to know. They will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, their God. Moses, I know your name. I know where you live. I hear their cries. I can hear their moans. I feel their name. I have come down to rescue them. But the book doesn't end there. Here's my name. Here's my special name. I am here to live among you, to dwell with you. I will set up my tent right around your tents. That's the key to the book. So our life with God doesn't start with making himself known to us. It doesn't stop with him saving us. What does he want from us? <sighs> to realize he's that close and to live among us. That's what he wants. And that's what he's shooting for. The Lord became flesh. And what did he do? He tabernacled among us. It's like John is saying, don't miss this. Jesus, God the Son, moved into the neighborhood. This God who rescues you, who knows the pain you're going through, wants, this to know, wants you to know this about him. He's with you. And he's that close. I mean, this... This God's self-disclosure, this revelation about himself, about your, uh, think about it, your whole Bible. Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve, sin. What does God do? He walks through the garden hunting for people. He wants to be with them. Later on, Exodus 25, we go from uh, God walking through the garden saying, where are you? Adam, where are you? We get to, you know what? I'm going to build a tent right around you people. I want to be with you people. Psalm 14 says, God is present in the company of the righteous. He wants to hang out. How close does he want to be? 
That close. That close. No one is going home alone today if you know Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Hmm. Isaiah says, call him Emmanuel. Call him Emmanuel. It's like God is saying, Isaiah, tell them this. Emmanuel, it's like, I got to get down there. I want to be among them. How close do you want to be? The word became flesh, John tells us. I got to get close to these people. Gospels tells us, said, how close did he get to people? He touched them. Remember Mark, there's a leper and he touches the leper? That's how close he wants to get. So think about that. How close? Yahweh. Hmm. Paul's going to take this tabernacle revelation of God and move it to the church. I mean, this is awesome. Paul is taking this incarnational, incarnational nature of the church, and he's saying, okay, God no longer does it in a tent. He no longer does it in a building, the temple. Here's the tabernacle of God. Here's the presence of God in the church. And come together once a week, get in your small groups throughout the week. But the whole point of the church is this. I'm among them. My presence is here. And as all you people go northwest, east, and south as you leave here, um, what are we doing? We're taking God with us among the lost. Why? So he can get this close to them. As his church can spread out and literally touch people, go breathe on someone this week. Some of you, take a mint first. I have a mint in my pocket. Come get this. It's got lint on it. That's the whole point. The glory is not in the tabernacle. The glory is not in the temple. The glory is in the church. So go and touch the lost. How close should we get? As close as God is to you. How close as God is to you? That's how close. Huh? Remember, we, we pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Things are done a certain way in heaven, folks. And uh, when you obey and you do what he desires, you're doing things as they're done in heaven. So think about Jesus' prayer now. Um, my actions bring heaven to earth. Jesus praying for your earth be done on, on earth as it is in heaven. Our obedience brings heaven to earth. We say to our unsaved neighbor, we're really trying to get them saved. Do you want to go to heaven when you die, right? Good question, I guess. But try this instead. Do you want heaven here? I mean, do you want heaven here right now? In your home, in your marriage, as you're trying to parent or grandparent or get through this crisis. Do you want heaven here? How, how do you get it? You believe in the great I am who is the God of the universe, who created the universe with just a word, let there be light. And yet he wants to be the kind of God who lives among us. Boy, he's as close as breathing. He is here. And our job, Moses is going to get a job with this disclosure. Our job this week, our business is bringing heaven to earth through our obedience. So you and God this week, uh, don't think every day, don't think every decision, don't think every action. Just think you and God this week, Every breath, you and God, every breath, God is with you this week, and God is living among you this week, and he's got a job for you. Go touch the lost. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for...